Um, and I want to welcome everybody to the, the second uh, Douglas C. Allen lecture. Um, and I want to extend a, a, a special welcome to Kathleen <coughs> Jordan, who are here tonight. I don't know if you do how to say hello. Um, uh, and for, for the students that are new uh, and don't know who Doug Allen is, I never got a chance to meet Doug, but I can tell you uh, uh, that he had a profound impact on the school. He taught here for 37 years. He was an administrator. He was an associate dean at a certain point. He taught a course uh, called History of Urban Form. And all of you have probably heard of that course, but it's still being taught here. Uh, and it was, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's essentially, it's a legendary course. It's the only way to describe it, because people talk about it. Students talk about it with fondness. Faculty talk about it. Um, and they also, you know, all the faculty that are still here, that, that were here when Doug was here, uh, speak extremely passionately about, about Doug, and I can tell you that, that almost a day doesn't go by that his name doesn't come up. Um, so he has had a huge impact on the school, and it, and it continues, and uh, my only regret is that I didn't get a chance to meet him, but I, I, I indirectly know a lot about him, so it's, uh, uh, it's great to have this lecture over right here. Um, a group of colleagues, students, uh, and, and friends uh, a couple of years ago started the Doug Allen Institute. Uh, this is just some, kind of an indication of how important it was to so many people. Um, and I want to invite uh, Bill Haley up, who was part of that group, to give you a little information on that, on that, uh, on that, on that organization. Hey, Bill? Thank you. Well, I've been introduced. Uh, can you hear me? Do I need the microphone? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Doug had such a great influence on the students here. And about in, in October two years ago, when he was very close to passing away, several of his colleagues, friends, students were cognizant of this and concerned because the history of urban form had, had such an impact on everybody. And what they were concerned about was we don't want Doug's ideas to just sort of fizzle out and not be out there. They are so good and so important. And so a decision was made among several of us to start the Douglas C. Allen Institute in the study of cities. And the, the idea was to preserve, spread, and perpetuate Doug's teachings. Take Doug's teachings and present those around the world. People will study that. And uh, I believe, and the belief communicated to us by all of his ex-students who are many now prominent architects around the world um, was that it gave them a different way of looking at cities, a different way of focusing on differences and changes in cities, and a different way of doing something to make cities better. And so the, the institute was formed with the idea of accomplishing that. We actually came up with a mission statement, which I'm going to read to you just so I don't get it wrong. Um, but the mission statement says this, it is to advance the understanding of how cities grow and evolve over time. And you can supplement that with the hope and confidence that by doing so, we will contribute to a more sustainable, adaptable, and enjoyable built environment. The first part is really Doug. The, the last part everybody wants. The first part is Doug, how cities grow and evolve over time. And Doug, of course, as some of you know, many of you may have heard, was such an expert on cities like Rome, and he studied how these cities grew and evolved over time. And that message and that method is something that we hope to perpetuate and spread for the good of everybody. So the Institute, what have we done? Well, we've taken the history of urban form. We have the recordings of those lectures. The idea, and we're working on it, and by the way, it's difficult and extensive and complicated and hard to figure out, but we're making videos. Videos are going to be more attractive, they're going to be more successful in spreading the, the ideas and spreading the, the, the concepts that Doug has taught. And these videos, once they're created, that they're, they're 40 lectures, 32 of them are recorded audio, and we're going to have someone speak over the others. We're going to have a video. And these will be available online. And we're anticipating and hoping that those will be available for continuing education online. There's a magazine that we're going to start in December called Odium. 
and um, you might enjoy your own podium by looking it up and trying to figure out what it means. <laughs> but um, that's going to come out in December, and if you sign up on the list and put your um, email address on there, out in the lobby on the table, uh, that uh, will result in you getting the Odium issues with no charge. It's just, uh, you'll get newsletters and the Odium. Uh, we're starting some scholarship uh, programs uh, where we're going to give students who are students in architecture, landscape architecture, design, uh, scholarships. And we're working on funding those, Georgia Tech, different places, trying to get all that started up. And then um, the there's a a design museum or museum. I want to get the name right on that so I didn't bring it on paper. But the idea is that, <laughs> excuse me, the Doug Allen Archive and History of Urban Form Library. And uh, Paul, Paul Knight is working on that, collecting, collating, archiving Doug's works. One thing we expect to come out of that will be an exhibition of his works and we have uh, an idea that we'll be able to make that an exhibition that appears here, appears there, that we to spread this around. So, we've got the table in the lobby. You have a little card out there that tells you about the institute. You can sign on in the lobby. And the only other thing is, if I can get the board members who are here to stand up, because somebody may want to stop you and ask you a question about it. So, that's Paul Knight, Kathy Allen, Bruce Rado, and me, we have other board members who weren't able to be here tonight. Uh, John Sketch, David Green, and Michael Rod are not able to be here tonight. But the four of us over here who are here will be glad to answer any questions you have. And um, thank you very much. And now I'll turn the stage back over. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, so tonight, um, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Kate Ork here uh, to, to talk about her work. Um, Kate uh, is a uh, very unique practitioner. Um, uh, I've known Kate for 10, 12 years. Uh, we were colleagues at, at Columbia for about 10 years. Uh, have worked together professionally. And, um, and I have to say, um, I just recently finished reading the book that she's going to talk about tonight, uh, Towards an Urban Ecology. That, it talks about her work, but it really there's much more to the book than just the work. And um, there are several things that, that, that really resonated. And when I, when I read a book, I, I always sort of uh, think that, a, that, that the, the true testimony of how good a book is is if it does one of three things. It makes you think about something that you haven't thought about before. Uh, it inspires you to do something. Or that it's useful. And the useful thing is really important. And I have to say, this book does all those things. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, the text is beautifully written. It weaves together facts that will just kind of you know, blow your mind when you kind of think about what it means. Uh, it's almost a kind of guidebook, in a way, about how to actually be proactive and make a difference in thinking about the future of our, of our world. Um, but it also, the thing that I find is most fascinating, and I think this is the way Kate practices with her current escape, is that it, 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 it sort of ties together scales of, of actions and, and scales of systems from literally like how you carry on your day-to-day -day life, how much water you use, how you deal with trash, to very large scale kind of um, sort of global systems. And effectively ties together those things in a way that you understand that, that you can actually make a difference and impact seemingly very abstract large-scale systems that are changing, uh, you know, changing our world today. And uh, it's a pretty amazing accomplishment. And, and, and I think that, that the book does that very effectively, but also I think her practice does it very effectively. Um, the thing that's most inspiring about the book and about her practice is that, she, is that they, they work in a kind of activist mode half the time and half the time doing very large-scale uh, urban designs. Uh, and again, not easy to do that. that is not, it's a really unique way to practice, and I think in some ways I don't know another practice that it works that way. And, it's, and, the, and the kind of engagement activist part is not token. I mean, this is real serious work. So it, it's, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Kate here. Uh, a few facts. Um, actually, some of this I didn't even know. She has a bachelor's degree from UVA in political and social thought. 
I didn't know that, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, a master in landscape architecture from Harvard's GSD. She's currently an associate professor at Columbia and, and just recently appointed the director of the Urban Design Program. Um, and I think is making some very, very interesting changes to that program. Um, she received the uh, American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Architecture in 2015. And she's uh, done three books. This is the most recent book, but just a couple of years ago, she did another super interesting book called Petrochemical America, which I, I strongly encourage you to get that book too. Um, and uh, so anyway, it's just really great to have Kate here tonight. I think you're going to really enjoy the work. And I think you're going to think. I think you're going to think about things you haven't thought about before. I think you're going to be inspired. And I think you're going to come away with like wanting to go out and do something. So anyway, Kate. so much, Scott, for that very generous introduction. And I'm so pleased to be here, um, particularly honored to be giving the Allen Lecture, given what I've read and now heard about this tremendous and, and clearly influential individual. And I can only hope, and I say this to the board <laughs> in all seriousness, that what I am trying to talk about today, the, which is how we um, kind of change our cities and start to work toward an urban ecology echo with, with some of, 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 of Professor Allen's aspirations. So, um, so yes, I'm here in sort of two ways as a, as a practitioner at SCAPE and also as um, the uh, uh, current director of Columbia Urban Design. Very excited to um, think through an urban design program through the lens of landscape and infrastructure and this is what we're uh, beginning to work on now. I thought to just show, to start off, a couple of images of the SCAPE office. We're, in many ways, as you know, a conventional office in the sense of work on the boards. You know, we work in teams, but in other ways, we we are almost, um, uh, I would say, have a, a very active and open position of of sharing. So we have this sort of open stance of sharing. We bring constantly students and uh, from all around the, over the world into the office. And then we take our kind of ideas out in the road. We've developed this kind of relationship with NGOs and uh, in the region. So this is just, you know, here we're presenting to eighth graders uh, at a sort of a disadvantaged school out in a, in a, near a housing project. But, um, and this, this project is, is uh, very uh, threatened by, by sea level rise. So, you know, I guess it's this kind of stance of radical sharing and, and sort of activism that I really want to impress upon you today. Um, so it's a, it's a design office in many ways that's conventional, but I would say that it is um, in some way I'm very motivated by, by issues. And um, these issues are incredibly real. Um, and, you know, and most of what I try to weave together in the Toward an Urban Ecology book is the sort of triple, you know, kind of uh, pattern that integrates threats from climate change to habitat loss as we're now in this um, sixth wave of, of extinction, many scientists say, in terms of loss of biodiversity and social inequity and lack of social cohesion. And I think the challenge is always, so, well, what can design do? You know, I'm trained as a designer, you all are as well sitting in this room. And that's not an easy question. But also, even more difficult is what, what can design practice do? Because very much design practice is, is driven by essentially kind of, you know, paying their rent and overhead and these other sorts of very practical matters. So um, what we've tried to do in the office is develop this kind of iterative uh, feedback loop between design and research and, and try to push projects through research questions uh, that don't we don't necessarily know the answers to do to, but then like tie them back into actual design work. And so, you know, that is the kind of design methodology that I speak about in, in the book Toward an Urban Ecology. And really, you know, the thesis of the book is and describes, hopefully in depth, how we aim to sort of overlay the power and re of regenerative landscape systems with the methods of community organizing and kind of mesh those two things. So each project, I'm always looking for the sort of sweet spot between those two aspects. And, um, 
and the book is organized into these four chapters, Revive, Cohabit, Engage, and Scale. So I'm not going to just talk through the book, but I thought to just, you know, I'll just touch on some of these words throughout the presentation. Um, so, uh, you know, but in, in general, you know, it is a kind of a call to action in, in, in many ways, in that as designers, we can generate ecosystems, we can forge new connections. This is a, so all these are pictures from, this is a picture from um, our, uh, an event that we did on Staten Island. Embrace the physical reality of landscape, not some kind of pastoral ideal of rolling green lawns. Revive landscape systems in our cities. Experiment, not be afraid to fail. Test, modify, and experiment again. And then engage people. And not just engage people in the sense of kind of like planning, check the box A versus B, but engage people literally in the making and conceptualization of projects. So I'll talk about some of these issues and, and sort of describe how um, I aim to address these in different ways through publications and books or, or kind of sit-ins or so, so on and so forth. So, so you know, it, it's hard to talk about climate change. We're kind of all inured, right, to these graphs that they're always going up on these exponential, um, you know, trends of carbon dioxide emissions. But I've always found this one to be very clarifying. This is a graph of RCP, which is representative carbon concentration pathways. This, what it means is basically the red line is business as usual, right? We're pretty much headed <laughs> all along that line. And then, you know, the brown line below it is like if we took incredibly radical stances toward green, non-carbon non polluting energy, which in itself is, you know, almost impossible to imagine without profound changes to our legal um, and, and, and political system and economic system. So, you know, we're on the path. And I kind of find this very orienting that, in my mind, there's not a technical fix. There's no kind of, quote unquote, silver bullet that's going to change the, the, the direction of this graph. So I've really sort of tried to focus on um, perception, engagement, and behavior as a way to kind of move the needle uh, and kind of raise awareness uh, uh, on, on this issue. So, you know, here's the engaged chapter. And I do think, as a landscape architect, um, that, you know, we think in terms of systems and connections. And, and so, you know, I do feel like a primary, um, you know, way that designers can make a difference um, is to be able to connect the dots between and among forces and factors that are very, very difficult to kind of see together uh, as in, in their pattern. So this is literally... This was the goal of the Petrochemical America book. And it's been out for a few years now, but it still feels kind of raw to me, and, and it's, it's exciting. It's a book that was um, done with photographs by Richard Mizrak. And it was a very, it was a great period of, of time in the office where we were slow on work, and I was like, you know, I'm going to just put this on the credit card. I want to work on this. We took many, many trips to Louisiana. We began to, you know, work with Richard. Um, and I began to basically take his photographs and, you know, analyze them and sequence them and um, try to understand, you know, you know, not only being on site and kind of researching in the landscape, but take the photographs as almost a site. So, you know, this is an amazing one which literally kind of connects this, you know, uh, displaced African-American man who's subsistence fishing with the scales of this kind of global economy of, of oil and the extraction landscape. So these photographs were just so rich that it was, it was um, a very emotional kind of year and a half of beginning to sequence the photographs and begin to thread a narrative through them. So we did this series of drawings called Through Lines that tried to connect the dots between America's addiction to oil, the extraction economy here, you can see um, offshore drilling uh, in the, the oil-rich uh, layers of the delta, and then uh, landscape impacts and impacts on public health. So I'm not going to show all the drawings from that book, but that's just to say that this was a kind of the goal of this book was narrative building and like perception building, um, and to sort of use the tools of drawing as a way of changing minds. Um, because I firmly believe that that documentation is design, and doing that creatively can really be uh, make a difference. So you know, the, we basically trace these path pathways of oil from extraction off the continental shelf in the Gulf and Deepwater Horizon occurred during the writing of the book. Um, followed that uh, through a series of hybrid 
um, natural and artificial infrastructures and understood how these hydrocarbons um, were uh, cracked and refined to make this kind of incredible plethora of, of um, chemicals that we somehow depend upon, but that all also kind of threaten our, our health and our hormonal system and, and et cetera. And then so this, the Gulf itself was a, a really fascinating place to try to tell that story of climate change because, you know, of course the extraction economy <laughs> means to some degree that it forces sea levels to ride, rise with carbon dioxide emissions, global warming, sea level rise, and the very kind of landscape that enabled uh, the, this oil-rich economy to emerge is now completely threatened. So everything here in dark teal is, is slated to be kind of clear, open water by 2050. We traced um, landscape health impacts uh, and learned that how these um, petrochemicals are stored not only in the landscape and say super fun sites and brownfield sites, but also in our bodies, how they threaten kind of life living and looped ecosystems and kind of unloop those systems and threaten biodiversity at this very large scale. So, you know, this is kind of a map. I realize it's like a map of like a brain <laughs> also looking at it, but how these kind of impacts and, and effects are completely interconnected. It's also a map of the chapters of the book, which starts with oil, ecology, food, infrastructure, waste, displacement, and landscape, and goes into everything kind of in gray here is basically like a caption of the book. So it was a real effort to try to kind of shake the landscape architecture um, community to kind of say, okay, it's not just about composing, you know, scenes in nature or trying to develop a, an aesthetic of performance, but can we actually look at the American landscape as a kind of a machine for consuming petrochemicals that we have gone to war to protect? So, you know, this is the last image in the book that Richard FedExed, you know, and I was just like, okay, we're done. We're done with this book. This is it. It's called The Lonely Shopping Cart. And I really feel like it is equally, you know, is beautiful. It, like, makes your eyes bleed. It's so beautiful. But it is also, you know, tells this story of this kind of social, physical, ecological kind of flattening um, of the world that we have made. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how landscape architects can begin to intervene in these conditions. Um, in particular, you know, the chapter Revive, one of the projects featured is a large-scale urban project called uh, Town Branch Commons, and that's at Lexington, Kentucky. Um, and so this is town branch. It's literally branches stream uh, out in the countryside. And if you say Lexington, Kentucky, everyone immediately thinks of like this picture horses, and bourbon. And there's a reason for that, uh, which I'll get to later. But Lexington is very well known for its countryside and not as well known for its downtown. And I'm afraid that this is probably one of the most dispiriting views of downtown. It is of Lexington, Kentucky, but I think you can all kind of imagine in your mind's eye that it could literally be almost any city in the US with a lot of beige and even some blue glass here. So this is Town Branch under this road. It is a state highway that runs through the center of the city. And to me, this project just talked to so many issues that I was interested in that have to do with the way that cities have been transformed by the automobile, this kind of lack of social cohesion, sort of lack of, of connection at the street. So we entered an international design competition, and we kind of went on this like sleuthing expedition to find where the water was. And so here we found some of Town Branch here, you know, behind an arena. We found it underground. So this is the culvert of Town Branch under the, the street of Lexington. And then we, we, but we realized it was not an immediate pattern. And why this was is because of the sort of underlying geology of karst. Does anyone know what karst is? It's like... It's like, it's like one of those words you heard in sixth grade geology, but you're not sure what it is. It's basically a kind of a kind of limestone, but I was so inspired by this. And Lexington is right here in the bullseye of karst occurrence. So karst is always in this kind of state of quasi-dissolve. It's not granite. You know, Manhattan is on granite and schist, and karst is always kind of constantly dissolving. And water does not move in a straight line through the karst landscape. So when the mayor and others asked us to kind of think about, um, you know, the downtown of Lexington, this seemed like a really great kind of starting point. 
Um, and so we learned that water moves in various ways through the landscape. It, it will disappear for half a mile, reappear in the form of boils, and disappear again. So we went out and sort of hiked around and found these basically kind of like landscape forms in, in the sort of in the countryside. So here you can see there's a blue hole, an interrupted stream channel, a swallet where water disappears uh, down, a karst window, which I was like, we're definitely well, that's very interesting spatially, karst window and boils. And so this is a sort of an area where water's reappearing from an underground stream and falls where even where you have a very small amount of water, it's very clean. So, but here, you know, this was basically, this image was, and experience was the trigger for the whole project in the sense of urban boils. Okay, so now we kind of have an idea. And for the whole competition, we then began to reinterpret the way that that water moves through the karst topography into urban spaces that um, are connecting programmatically with the existing programs of, of Lexington. So this was the sort of framework plan that we developed, reveal, clean, carve, connect. And, and this is a sort of a map of how those specific landscape forms then meld with a kind of an urban design program. So I'll go quickly through these. Um, reveal is where we actually can show uh, the waterway, where we made sort of a floodable park um, that is, um, excuse me, during the, during the day or during a non-flood event is play fields, et cetera, and during a flooding event can hold water. Um, uh, um, and here's a sort of before. This is what you see when you drive into Lexington. It was kind of a before and the, like, the mayor's fancy image for after. Clean, which is in the downtown Greenway, and um, which was this kind of place where, like, there's literally, if you work in downtown Lexington, this is pretty much what's going on. So the idea was to make this sort of boulevard that had smaller programs and um, uh, places to eat inside it that was also porous, and that this pavement kind of echoed this kind of state of quasi-dissolve of, of the karst landscape. And these are the elements of the project. Carve. And of course, you know, much of my work in New York City and all around re requires arguing with the Army Corps of Engineers and trying to prove things to them and all of the regulators. And this very simple section enabled this entire project to happen because there's, we discovered there is a, a, a dupli dupli duplication in the culvert. So we were able to use the lower culvert as stormwater control, flood control, and therefore the, the, the buildings around there did not have to uh, lose their flood insurance. So this is Karst, um, the Karst Commons. <laughs> you remember that Karst window. Here it is, the Karst Commons, which is more of a kind of a cultural plaza that takes advantage of the Kentucky Theater and, and other um, programs surrounding it to kind of really help spur on this gradual cultural regeneration. This is the space now with a big transit stop and a theater facing the opposite direction and this kind of future landscape that's much more tied into identity and sort of bioregion that it is grounded in. And finally, Connect, um, we learned that there are, there are two neighborhoods on the opposite sides of this road. One is literally 100% white. The other is mixture of African Americans and other uh, you know, ethnic groups, and there is a vast divide between them. So our idea here was simply to have a very, very small scale, smaller scale programs that can serve as literally a kind of connection uh, to the corridor. So I think what's exciting now is that, you know, after working on the project, we did the competition, we did a huge engineering feasibility study, literally people with measuring tapes trying to understand where bikes could fit through. And what we learned really is that the project is, even though it's, our site is here, it's really something that is unlocking this whole series of kind of urban rural connections that are currently blocked. So ideally, the, the project will sort of bring those two you know, slides that I showed you of the urban and the rural closer together um, in terms of spatially for, for all people of Lexington. Um, it's also, this is a huge stormwater project. And I think what's exciting is now we're in the midst of doing essentially design development, a block by block plan for this project. We got a, there was a Tiger grant, there's funding from the mayor's office. And um, even though, you know, we won the competition back in 2013, it's been just a, just a slog, like trying to get through and get this thing funded. Because it's not an easy project. It's a very difficult project that involves public, private, different landowners, et cetera. But a couple words on kind of this concept of, of engagement, because I think really it, with, it, with those kind of very sort of 
ish, ways of working that help the project kind of pull forward. Because in the meantime, between you know the competition win and now our kind of full on DD, we kind of developed this sort of series of outreach activities that were really designed to foster kind of a direct engagement uh, with Town Branch itself. So we developed this thing called the Town Branch Water Walk with a $20,000 grant from the DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality. And we worked with University of Kentucky students to develop these podcasts where you can kind of walk the length of Town Branch and kind of listen while you walk. And we kind of synced that up with some of the horse racing events, which are much more popular. So it was a way of kind of working with UK students. It was a way of kind of getting a lot of people involved. We ended up taking over part of the street and kind of doing a, a sit-in or a, I don't know what you would call it, a activist sort of project where we took over parking spaces along Vine Street. And then we sort of, um, we had this place where you could listen and walk. And, um, and so um, basically it's very exciting to sort of say that we're, 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 we're working on it now and it's um, going to be built by 2018, 2019. So another kind of aspect of the, the book that I kind of, that I really want to focus on is this concept of cohabit. Because so long, you know, within the profession of landscape, we've been very focused on the human experience, and that is not to be underestimated. But the fact is that we do share the world with a whole range of other species. Um, and, and so an early project on cohabit, and this was actually my first book, um, was called was Bird Safe Building Guidelines. Because even though we can design the most biodiverse flowing meadows that's on the cover of every magazine or a rich you know, tropical forest, that those forests may be empty and lacking species. And so this um, set of guidelines um, shows and uh, describe the problem of birds coll colliding with bu buildings. And this is an incredibly difficult um, slide to show, but in you know, New York, Toronto, Chicago, they're incredible bird strike issues. And they're not pigeons, they're warblers, they're neotropical migrants. And so we developed this very quick, you know, with a grant from US Fish and Wildlife Service, set of bird safe design guidelines that was just sort of very simple saying, here's what's the problem, here's what are potential solutions, bird safe glass, etc. So this is just a scape project that's, you know, we spent all of our budget on the bird safe glass. But that's a big, you know, that's a big issue, and I would urge every architect in the room. Those guidelines have been incorporated into the American Bird Conservancy's um, overall guidelines, so it's very exciting. The other way we try to think about cohabitats is to design always to make room for animals. And you know, much of Scape's work has been centered around the water and kind of designing with water. I've been accused of many things, of being a waterscape architect, of being like a crazy oyster lady, of all these things. But it's really true that I, I completely almost see New York's landscape as being turned inside out, where I'm completely focused on this aspect and not here as much. Um, but I'll just throw, show a couple of projects where, you know, water is always shown in straight lines, right? This is literally a straight line on a map um, which is a typical bulkhead. This is legal bulkhead in the New York Harbor, and it is death knell for, for animals. So a lot of our projects, and I'm just going to show some unrelated, have been trying to understand literally this very, very thin ecotone section that connects land and water. And in every project that we have, we have a number of developer projects on the water now, to kind of maximize um, that thin section um, and make a legal case to the DEC and to the Army Corps for doing something differently. So this is, for example, a project in Red Hook where the, there is a current vertical bulkhead that is permitted and as of right. And we have convinced them to do a sort of a textured, stepped landscape which is very exciting, and even where our client wouldn't let us do a, uh, you know, we have a vertical wall here, we have a sort of ecological concrete and a special texture to, um, a, a, a special concrete that sort of recruits marine life, um, and so we develop sections that kind of maximize habitat at every level. And it's great when developers pay for it. So this is actually another example on the East River where we, we've developed this kind of gradient of the missing subtitle. There's this lost realm of, of subtitle landscape um, that is so important for marine fish and mammals 
um, and we've worked with E-Concrete to develop these special units and try to, try to literally kind of think about this land water as a gradient and even in the smallest of spaces try to maximize change and biodiversity within the landscape. So I guess I wanted to say a couple more words or some words on social, social inequity because I think it's one of the hardest things to talk about. I mean, equity is a, a word that we're all kind of grappling with, like what does it mean and, and how can we sort of move in that direction? And it's been, you know, as a landscape architect, it's difficult to know how to um, proceed because often landscapes are really only the purview of the wealthy. But we are trying to, to change that. And I guess this book was instructive to me. It is a book by a sociologist Eric Kleinenberg on the heat wave of 1995 that happened in Chicago. And um, uh, he basically, you know, so this is really kind of a book that pulls together climate crisis with social lack of social cohesion. And so I felt like reading this book, it, it wasn't kind of saying what how to redefine beauty or how to define equity, but it was certainly describing in incredibly vivid terms what is a complete, you know, you know, the worst possible outcome because he tracks, um, you know, uh, households with one inhabitant, people living alone, and also people over 65 living alone. Sort of, it's hard to imagine, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a portrait uh, uh, that is more difficult than that. And also that these are these are the sort of poor individuals that perished during the heat wave. And so Eric's book, and I'm just showing a couple of slides about it, but is is very instructive in the sense of he kind of talks about the spatial fragmentation of, of networks. He talks about the sort of social ecology produced by dec decades of abandonment. And, and so, you know, and the violence of everyday life. So a lot of what I've tried to think about is like, okay, so what is the opposite of that? What is a city that is the opposite of that? What is a city that um, is involving people in <laughs> decisions where, where possible? What is a city that is working a uh, hands-on way on regenerating ecology? And I feel like design has a sort of really critical role to play. So everyone says, oh, well, what is a Kate Orff landscape? And I don't know. I couldn't say it's a series of cones or it's a curving line or anything, but I will hope to say that it is the opposite of those images and the opposite of that book, where it's uh, ideally landscapes that are bringing people together and landscapes that sort of, not only in their physical form, but in their making, kind of generate new social life. So, you know, I, I put this quote up here from Kenneth Frampton. This came out while I was at the GSD, also with Professors Bell and Slocum were there. Um, and Frampton, you know, this was very important to me, this article, and kind of completely reset my head. You know, I was learning how to draw and curl the pencil and make lines that were a certain way, and it was, you know, it was a sort of a more Beaux-Arts type of education. But this, this article by Kenneth Frampton was orienting in that he kind of writes, article, Ar architecture must assume an ecological stance in the broadest possible sense. And so that's really you know, what I've tried to, um, to, to frame in the book uh, toward an urban ecology is this concept. And of course, the, the title is a sort of um, homage to Ken. Um, uh, it, it's sort of a, ways that we've tried to assume the, this, this broad stance. So the last project I'm going to show you is called Living Breakwaters, and it does really try to capture and encapsulate how we've tried to do two, two things. One is design across multiple scales, from the smallest unit to the largest <laughs> sort of um, um, ecological sort of scale. And then the second is how to sort of try to integrate physical and social systems, like I mentioned, bringing together regenerative ecosystems with uh, community organizing, and so we've tried to do that. It's described in the chapter called Scale, and um, basically the sort of backstory of this is that back in, I guess it was 2009, I was asked to do an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art and came up with this sort of big a concept called oyster texture that was kind of growing out of a very careful look and kind of enthusiasm for marine life. I had just written about Jamaica Bay and the oyster and really kind of brought a lot of people together around that, that project. And then, you know, I got very frustrated because after that museum 
kind of exhibit. It was like, oh, that's so great, but it'll never happen. And oh, the water's so polluted, and Kate, and this and that. So I don't know. It was sort of like, OK, well, let's see two things. You know, test all the, the scenarios. How polluted is the water? How to make it happen? How might it be funded? How might it be described as infrastructure? And so after, after, our, after oyster texture, then we embarked on this series of very, very small scale pilots. And this was a pilot that was out in the Gowanus Bay. And it was literally just a probe to try to understand water quality. This is Gowanus is a declared super fun site. So we developed this kind of strategy of, of kind of testing water quality. We have um, tidal pools embedded in the, in the sort of a, a adjacent area. And then we hosted this kind of knitting party in the office where people were literally knitting fuzzy rope, which is used in the aquaculture industry to cultivate blue mussels. And we had pie and beer and milk. I don't know. I can't remember now. That doesn't sound good, pie and beer. But. <laughs> Um, and we, we knitted these, these panels, and then we, we went out on the pier in the Gowanus Bay, which is near the project, and we put them in the water to try to test water quality, and had Michael Judge, who's a professor. And so we, we got tons and tons of, of blue mussels, which have, um, you know, sort of great kind of water filtration capacity. So, you know, this was exciting, and it was proof of concept to some degree, and more importantly, through this small project, I got to meet the whole range of Department of Environmental Con um, Conservation regulators who would then later be our regulators for what is now the Living Breakwaters Project, which is getting built. So it, even though it was small in its form, it opened up and unlocked this kind of whole network of, of people that ultimately there's, there's, there's this huge community now that we're all kind of oriented towards the same thing. So, you know, this kind of gets me to a little bit of a side topic, but I really feel like this, this concept of design to redefine beauty. I don't know if you recognize this image. This is the, on the cover of the book. Um, it is a tuna kit from that project, and I really saw and I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Because, you know, in a way, obviously, there's flowers, and, you know, I was like, okay, can we get beyond thinking about landscape as just being this backdrop, this sort of pastoral green, you know, place where... Uh, you know, which is fertilized with nitrogen fertilizer and just that, that is this passive setting for human life to unfold. Can we really challenge that and kind of make, bring people together around making the landscape, working in the landscape? And so that's, that's sort of the goal. So um, after we developed some, some of those um, uh, prototypes, uh, we had some trauma in the New York region where we had Hurricane Irene, which is a very heavy rain-based storm, and Sandy uh, hit the region. Here's the cloud, which kind of truly obliterates any kind of sense of line uh, in the landscape. And so the, the SCAPE office uh, worked on Mayor Bloomberg's um, special initiative for rebuilding a resiliency report. We um, uh, worked on and developed the coastal protection chapter. And then after that, um, the uh, U.S. HUD, um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, hosted a competition called Rebuild by Design through President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Task Force. And Rebuild by Design was basically designed to spend in a different way some of the disaster relief money coming into the region, not just to build back what had been there, but to sort of project forward, anticipate new conditions, and try to envision new forms of infrastructure. So this is our, our team, and what's exciting is that the project won um, $60 million worth of funding. So, I mean, I'll just say very briefly what Living Breakwaters is, is a two-mile two linear chain of breakwaters that slow the, slow the water, reduce wave action, reduce risk, and they are paired with an onshore dune um, uh, 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 that, uh, to help protect communities onshore. That it is also, um, these breakwaters are designed in a way to kind of maximize their marine ecological benefit. And they are also stewarded by schools, city, uh, students in the New York City public school system on shore through something called the Billion Oysters Project. So what I just described is this exact kind of concept about, or stance, if you will, about resiliency. That it's not just like, we will passively be protected. There's going to be this wall, and I'm just going to go on. But what I was trying to do in this project is kind of force a, a kind of state of constant 
interaction where you have the risk reduction break of the breakwaters, the rebuilding ecology, rebuilding economy, and, um, and constantly sort of re bring um, educators and, and school kids to the shoreline, a replenished shoreline. So just a couple more words on this project before I close. Um, here is the site here at South Staten Island. And I think what's in immediately clear when you look at this land formation, which is called the New York Bight, you can see how Sandy kind of funneled in and hit this area very hard. So people lost lives on Staten Island. Waves were crashing on structures. And um, the bay landscapes, in my mind, are ecological infrastructure, right? It's kind of reframing our, uh, our, our environs and trying to understand that we have infrastructure um, in our midst that is fast disappearing due to rising sea levels. So as part of the research phase of this project, we kind of took an inventory of all the sort of protective landscapes that are incredibly valuable and protective, but also incredibly endangered, from maritime shrublands and forests to subtidal reefs and islands. Then we began to think about how, um, rather than a kind of a singular wall, that we would develop this concept of a layered approach, pairing habitat breakwaters with onshore dunes, um, you know, raising houses, et cetera, and, I, and, and integrating public program into this more resilient cross-section. So Staten Island itself um, has incredible erosion issues. It's eroding faster and faster. And um, for example, this was a street. Um, this is what you would call temporary erosion measures. It's a plastic trash bag that was eroded. You know, they covered it with sand, and like a day later, it looked like this, spewing all that plastic into the environment. And so, you know, we felt like our the kind of concept really works well here in that breakwaters reduce wave action. Even um, uh, um, they build beaches, and importantly, that the the erosion that I showed you in Staten Island is eroding the public beach up to the private uh, property line. So there, there's not a civic beach <laughs> life anymore because everyone's put these vertical bulkhead walls. So we, it can rebuild beaches, but also rebuild literally public space. Um, and we were very clear with the community of what they do uh, and what they do and what our goals were and what they do not do is completely keep out flood water. And so for the project, the big picture was we're not going to do a master plan, right? Because it, does, it doesn't really work. <laughs> you know, you can't really do a resilient master plan, right? Because it doesn't have uncertainty built into it. But what we would do is a kind of a cross-section, and that cross-section could be tested and potentially replicated. Um, so in this section, it really shows how culture on shore is rebuilt along with, you know, eco ecology is regenerated within the habitat breakwater and risk is reduced to try to set into motion a kind of a, we all know what the downward spiral looks like, right? It looks like the sixth wave of, of extinction. It looks like these kind of tipping points. But what, what is an, a regenerative kind of counterpoint to that? And that was the, the, the goal of this project. Here's a cross-section of the, the breakwater structure itself and how it rebuilds habitats at multiple levels of subtidal to intertidal to upland levels. How reef streets, um, this is the kind of innovation of the reef street where the breakwater itself is modified and designed with these micro, sort of mid-scale reef streets that form kind of public space for fish where they can shelter in the structure. And um, we learned that um, the most um, endangered kind of habitat in the entire New York region is structural habitat. So juvenile fish literally have nowhere to, to hide. So, and then we also in, innovated with materials with this low pH concrete and re using recycled glass in the form of a, a breakwater unit. With, um, so you can see these kind of nested scales, if you will, from the scale of the small tiny pore in the concrete to the scale of the notch and ne to the scale of the unit, et cetera, and, and up to the reef street and, and to the shore. Um, we um, have now gone through surveying. We found oysters in the nearby uh, region, uh, in the near kind of structural habitat nearby. So we're quite convinced that combining um, this existing very tiny oyster population combined with the four innovative ways that we're doing urban um, oyster restoration, that these um, breakwaters, when they're seeded with oysters, can come back. And so I also thought just to show this quick fun video, if it works, because, you know, you know, it basically, 
there's some R-rated action up here with the, the bluegrass. <laughs> but, but I think that it kind of, I guess these videos sort of speak to what I'm trying to get at, which is this sort of non-green landscape, this kind of closer, closer and kind of more direct experience um, with, um, with our environs as it exists. Whoops. So um, I think I'll kind of wrap up here, but these are the schools on the waterfront, our $60 million, at least $3 million of that is going towards schools and schools programming, which is also kind of exciting that the federal government acknowledges social infrastructure as a kind of a form of fundable infrastructure. So these schools will have the Billion Oysters um, curriculum, which is a New York State certified science curriculum where they will learn chemistry, math, biology through the act of restoration of the harbor through the Billion Oyster Project. Here, during the Rebuild by Design competition, everything gets turned on its head in climate change, right? So here's the, the Harbor School students teaching the teachers. Um, we made this sort of oyster gardening manual to, to share with other Staten Island teachers because the more of these oyster baskets we have um, in the water, the more uh, the spat and the sort of larvae that we have to um, um, share on the, to have on the reef. We made this kind of traveling model with um, its interactive model. Um, where, where children can kind of match uh, habitat uh, animals to their habitat. And now we're in the implementation phase where this t roughly two mile pilot is um, through uh, basically going into construction documents. It's very exciting. And so even though we have to do all this work with the Army Corps of Engineers and they pretty much just like word documents with Times Roman font, we really tried to push back and develop this sort of visual language. So this was our habitat survey, um, our onshore sur shoreline survey. So all of these are just, you know, m hundreds of thousands of dollars of surveys um, that are needed to advance this project. We developed um, a grasshopper model. This is the kind of Rosetta Stone of culture of coastal protection, a, a grasshopper model that is melded with our engineers um, uh, a swan model, wave model, so we can implement and, and describe different attributes and test those attributes. We tested it as infrastructure, its protective capacities. We, we tested 10 scenarios um, and um, through this model, I have a couple, I have a small video, but I think I might just skip over that because it seems like it's maybe too long. So I'm not going to show this this whole video, but this is actually what we showed at our community meeting recently, which is literally, you know, showing not just here's what you're going to get, but we showed the community all 10 scenarios, what historic shoreline change was, how big these breakwaters would be, what their effects would be, um, and how they change sediment pattern based on the sort of littoral drift. And video is something we're really pushing on in the office right now because, of course, landscape is living and changing and adaptable. So, um, so um, we're trying to kind of show video and uh, use video in many, many different ways to um, describe our projects. So, you know, it's pretty clear in terms of saying these are our goals and, well, I didn't show this, the sediment pattern happens, but I'm just going to keep going. Anyway, it shows how that shoreline changes in multiple ways with these 10 different scenarios. And here, here's the scenario that was the most efficacious and met all of our goals. And this is what we're doing CDs on now. So we took it from the walls of the museum to this sort of more evolved competition to now basically construction documents and sizing the rock, developing um, literally literally a kind of much more detail around the armor units, understanding how the core stone and scour stone works, understanding exactly where the, 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 the e-concrete and the sort of uh, reef units need to sit within the cross section, um, how those units sort of stack up. So here we have um, oyster gabion baskets um, along the edge here for shellfish. And this is the sort of landscape that's more designed to, uh, to um, shelter fin fish, like bass. The, our major, major constituency in this project are like all the fishermen and everybody comes out. So it's like these great community meetings. It's like, these are the fishermen. These are the teachers. These are the you know, firemen. They're all, they're, somehow this project has like found a piece of everybody's imagination. And, uh, and, and, and it's their advocacy that has really pushed it forward. So here's the sort of 
the Reef Street um, cross section and basically how you know the toe stones and how the whole thing kind of grows over time and, um, and as inhabited by this kind of huge range of, of marine life that is currently missing in New York Harbor. So we're here, we're, we're in the final design phase now and, um, and I guess I'll just close um, by saying that, you know, I think, I think what I'm trying to communicate is really that I, I don't feel like, you know, we're not, we're not trained as community organizers, we're not trained as sociologists, we're not trained, uh, you know, in this, in this way, but I think more and more what I've learned is that the physical project is only like a piece of it and that the real power of landscape is actually the power to inspire the power to kind of motivate people to sort of come together. And it's really, um, there are meetings like this. This is our EIS scoping meeting. It is part of a legal process. Um, there are going to be many boring community meetings like this, but also that there are ways that you can rethink how you think about landscape and rethink the process, not as just project photograph, project photograph, but there's this kind of gradient of thinking and action and activism um, that can kind of pull through um, through everything that we do, and it is this kind of kind of spirit that is is very motivating for me. So I'm really focused on this concept of making publics, not just projects, and um, and that way I feel like we will move more toward an urban ecology. So this is, I'll close with this fun letter. We do a lot of community meetings. So this was one where we had folks in my office went and did like a a water hub charrette, because on shore you saw that yellow star was a water hub, and so this girl wrote self-contained atmospheric protection ensemble, and I thought that couldn't be a better way to, <laughs> to describe what we aspire to be. Thank you.